The conquest of Africa is underway again, this time by Africans. The brown Africans of the north are already free, the Sudan, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria on the way. Now colonialism is crumbling in black Africa. Ghana and Guinea are free, and Nigeria stands on the eve of freedom. Nigeria is the most populous country in all Africa, some 36 million people. It's the biggest remaining piece of the British Empire to go. It will be the largest independent black nation in all the world. That is our story. Governor General Sir James Robertson and Lady Robertson welcome the royal couple as they leave the Argonaut. In a temperature around 100 mark, the Queen still looks cool as the royal car makes its 13-mile journey to the capital at a steady 8 miles an hour. Every foot of the way, the road is packed with Nigerians. The welcome is as tremendous as any Her Majesty has ever been given. And it's a proud welcome, for this is no longer a people in colonial subjection, but a free nation with its feet already firmly on the road to self-government. Great hopes are centered on this new Nigerian leadership. Nigeria, a country as big as Pakistan, is rapidly becoming self-governing. Many expect it to become the foremost Negro state of the continent. The stage was set when Nigeria gained independence from Great Britain in 1960. With mineral wealth and a population of over 100 million, it was time for Nigeria to take its place as Africa's first superpower and a stabilizing democratic influence in the continent. But on the contrary, regional conflicts and corruption plagued the nation. And barely six years into the new government, the Nigerian military is disrupting the course of Nigerian history forever. The coup now begins to look more and more like a straightforward military revolt against corruption in government, and one that's likely to last. There was a bloodless coup today in Nigeria, which is black Africa's biggest and richest nation, and the world's eighth largest oil producer. Um, it's, uh, have a... The January 15, 1966 coup marked the beginning of a succession of coups, counter coups, and military rule for the next 33 years. But to truly appreciate the events of the morning of January 15, 1966, it is important that one understands the events leading up to that tragic day. By the time Nigeria gained independence in 1960, the British had carved Nigeria into three regions. The north being the largest with predominantly Hausa Fulanis and the south with two competing ethnic groups, the proud and the culturally rich Yorubas in the southwest and the energetic, industrious Igbos in the southeast. In between them were about 250 other heterogeneous tribes. The differences between them were accentuated by religion. The south is predominantly Christian and the north Muslim. Party politics took on the identity and ideology of each of the three geopolitical regions. The largest and most dominant party in the northern region was the Northern People's Congress, NPC, with its immensely powerful leader, the Sadauna of Sokoto, Alahaji Sa Amadou Bellu. He could have been prime minister, but he instead chose to become premier of the northern region and handed over his prime minister chair to his deputy, Tafawa Balewa. You are not a candidate yourself for the federal house. No, I, I, no, I am not. So you would not be federal prime minister well, I don't want to be. Would you yourself accept appointment if given to you as Governor General? I have nothing to do with that. I would rather live here amongst my own people and carry my traditional title than an imported one.
The Western Region's dominant party was the Yoruba-led action group AG, led by the energetic chief Obafemi Awolowo, and the Eastern Region was dominated by the Nigerian Council of Nigerian Citizens, NCNC, led by the eloquent Dr. Namdi Azikiwe. After independence, the NPC took control of the federal government, with Balewa as Prime Minister and Dr. Namdi Azikiwe as Governor General, in place of the outgoing British incumbent, Sir James Robertson. His title was later changed to President in 1963, when Nigeria became a republic. The Northern and Eastern regions formed a coalition government at the center, while the Western region formed the opposition. Even though Balewa was generally considered a humble man with integrity, he was also viewed, rightly or wrongly, as Amadou Bello's puppets by Southern politicians. They resented the fact that the country was being ruled by proxy by the Sadauna. I have nothing to do with that. Also, the fact that many Southern politicians, such as Azikiwe and Awolowo, were erudite intellectuals, while Balewa and Amadou Bello did not have university degrees, made some Southern politicians feel that Northern politicians were not intellectually fit to rule the country. My good friend, the Prime Minister of the Federation, Al-Haji Abubakar Dababa Balewa, in his broadcast the other night, committed what I thought was a faux pas, which a Prime Minister should not commit. On the other hand, northern leaders feared that a Yoruba Igbo allegiance from the south could swamp them and threaten their political dominance. The acrimony between the regions reached fever pitch in 1963, when the results of a census revealed that the population of the southern region was greater than that of the northern region. The census figures were very crucial because each region's results determined its share of seats in the parliament, and as such, all regions were assumed to have engaged in inflating its population count. However, the results from the south showed an astronomically high rate of population growth, never before seen in the history of mankind. The Prime Minister ordered for a verification of the results, during which an additional 8 million people were added to the northern count. The verification revealed that the north did in fact have a higher population than the south. The census figures further created a huge rift between Balewa's NPC and Azikiwe's NCNC, and leaders from both parties traded words publicly. In the opposition camp, party leader Awolowo and his deputy, Samuel Akintola, were embroiled in a stormy power tussle arising from political differences. While Awolowo favored maintaining the action group as an effective opposition alternative, Akintola advocated forging closer links with the government, as he saw little to be gained in staying in opposition. The difference in ideologies eventually led to a complete breakdown of law and order in the Western region. The Prime Minister declared a state of emergency in the region, and Awolo War was arrested and charged for treasonable felony. On the streets, the opposing factions engaged in random acts of violence and destruction of properties. This set the stage for hoodlums to take to the streets, molesting innocent citizens. The civil unrest in the region ended the moniker the Wild Wild West. The bad blood between the NPC and the NCNC gave birth to new political coalitions between the ruling NPC, MDF, and Akintola's NNDP. They merged to become the Nigerian National Alliance, NNA. The NCNC also sought new friends in the action group, and the coalition was joined by the UMBC and the NEPU to form the United Progressive Grand Alliance, OPGA, led by Dr. Opara, all in preparation for the federal elections of 1964. The NPC did not hesitate to frustrate the OPGA candidates in the northern region, so that most of them could not file in their nomination documents. This was unacceptable to the OPGA, and Dr. Opara called for a mass boycott of the elections by supporters nationwide. The election still proceeded to hold, with the NNA sweeping almost every office in the land. This loop-sided federal structure was a time bomb waiting to detonate. The year 1965 witnessed a worsening of the political situation in Nigeria. The Tiv riots against the high-handed Sadauna's government warmed up and showed no signs of abating. It was no doubt a year of political gloom throughout the country. Generally, the people had been disillusioned by the Balewa Akintola Sadauna clique of the NNA, a 
Economic, social, educational, and political problems were not solved. Corruption was rife, and nepotism was the order of the day. The political trend in most parts of the world in the late 50s and early 60s was towards the military takeover of government, in which the soldier statesman emerged during a political tension to restore his country's social, political, and economic stability. It was only a matter of time before the idea of a military intervention was mooted in the barracks. Well, now that you're here, I think we can all proceed. Good to see you could all make it. The revolution has begun. By 1965, a group of British-trained Nigerian army officers were perfecting their plans to topple the Balewa government with a military-led revolution. It would take another year before their plans would come to fruition. The major planners included Major Emmanuel Arinzi Ifejuna, leader of the acclaimed revolutionaries. He enlisted into the army in 1960 and got his military training at the Mons of Sir Cadet School in the United Kingdom. He was the first black African to win a gold medal at the 1954 British Empire and Commonwealth Games. He was an Igbo from Onitsha. Major Patrick Chukuma Kaduna Nzeogu, a charismatic Sanos trained officer. He worked as a chief instructor at the Nigerian Military Training College, Kaduna, and was the first Nigerian army officer to be trained in intelligence. He was born in the northern region's capital of Kaduna to Igbo immigrant parents from the Midwest region. Major Adewale Adimoega. He enlisted into the army in 1961 and also got his training at the Mons Officer Cadet School in the United Kingdom. He was one of the first university graduates that enrolled into the army. He was a Yoruba from southwestern region. Others are Major Kristen Anuforo, Major Timothy Onwategu, Major Donatus Okafo, Major Humphrey Chukuka, Captain Ben Bullier, Captain Obona Oji, and a host of others. All but one of the major planners came from the southeastern region, and in time, the coup will come to be known as an Igbo coup. This is the list of our targets for immediate arrest at the HR. The mission is to arrest all of them, along with their right-hand men. Abu Bakar Tafawa Balewa, Samuel Ladoki Akintola, Dennis Chukude Osadebe, Michael Ihonukara Obara. And in the army, our target are Major General J.T. Rossi, the two brigade commanders, Brigadier Samuel Ademu Legun, and Brigadier Mai Malari Zakaria. Colonel Koa Muhammad, Lieutenant Colonel James Pam, Colonel Raf Shudeinde, and of course the most political officer in the army, Lieutenant Colonel Abogo Lagama, Commander Fort Battalion Ibadan. At H hour, we will strike simultaneously from all regional headquarters. I will head operations in the northern region. Ima, you will run operations in Lagos with Chuka and Okafo. Wali, you will cover the rest of the western region. And since we don't have troops stationed in Benin, we will send a small unit from Benin. By the time the revolution is successful, every officer who didn't join will regret. You can count on me, sir.
On the morning of January 15th, Major Nzegu led his men to the official residence of the Sadauna and subjected it to sustained artillery gunfire. In the weeks leading up to the coup, Nzeogu had carried out several reconnaissance missions on the Sadauna's residence, oftentimes using the cover of his office as chief instructor at the NMTC to bring out soldiers for a tactical operation. His men were unaware that the military exercise they were participating in was actually a practice run for a military coup to overthrow the government. They would only find out a few hours of the operation. Nzeogu personally conducted a search of the residence. When he found the Sadauna hiding with some of his wives and domestic staff, he shot Sir Amadou Bello dead along with his bodyguard and one of his wives. Nzeogu's co-conspirator, Timothy Nwatwegu, led a detachment of soldiers to Brigadier Ademu Legun's residence, the General Officer Commanding 1st Division in Kaduna. Nwatwegu made his way to the bedroom and found him in bed with his wife. They were both shot. Colonel Raf Shodendi was also shot dead by the mutinous soldiers. The governor of Northern Region, Sir Kashim Ibrahim, was arrested but not killed. Captain Ben Boulier coordinated the taking over of strategic locations and facilities like radio and TV stations. He achieved this with the help of other officers like Second Lieutenant John Atompera, Lieutenant Edwin Okafo, and Lieutenant Harris Egaga, among others. Captain Emmanuel Nwobosi drove from Abiokuta to Ibadan with a detachment of soldiers and headed directly to Samuel Akintola's residence to execute his orders. Unknown to him, Akintola had already been warned about the soldiers by his deputy, Chief Fanny Kayode's wife, whose husband had been arrested a few hours earlier. Akintola refused to surrender and instead engaged the soldiers in a fierce gunfight. He was killed in the shootout along with his nephew. The Lagos leg of the operation was led by Major Emmanuel Ifejuna. Other officers included Majors Ademoyega, Don Okafo, Chris Anoforo, and Humphrey Chukuka. In the early hours of the morning, Ifejuna, along with some officers, made their way to the Prime Minister's residence and arrested him after overpowering his security detail. After arresting Balewa, the soldiers went next door and arrested the finance minister, Chief Okoti Ebo. Major Ademoyega was in charge of setting up roadblocks and occupying strategic locations like the telephone exchange. Don Okafo led a detail of soldiers from the Federal Guard to the Brigade Commander's residence in Ikoi to arrest Brigadier Mai Malari. Okafo and his men got into an argument with the Brigade Commander's security detail, eventually leading to a gunfight. The chaos from the gunfight alerted Mai Malari, who made an escape to the road. As he was making his getaway on foot, he recognized the vehicle of his Brigade Major, Emmanuel Efejona, who at this point was on his way to the Federal Guard's barracks with the captured Prime Minister. Unknown to him, his Brigade Major was the leader of the mutineers. He waved down the vehicle for assistance and was promptly shot dead. Just hours earlier, Ifejuna and a host of officers, including most of the planners, were at a party being hosted by Brigadier Maimalari to celebrate his wedding. Ifejuna then proceeded to Ikwe Hotel, where Lieutenant Colonel Abogo Lagama was a guest. He forced the front desk officer at gunpoint to lure out Lagama on the pretext that he had an official phone call. When he came downstairs to receive the fake phone call, Ifejuna emerged from hiding and shot him dead on the spot. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonels Unegbe and Colonel Ku Mohammed were also accosted and arrested in their homes. Unegbe was shot in front of his pregnant wife, while Lieutenant Colonel Pam was arrested and taken to the Federal Guard's barracks. He was also shot dead. Major Okafo then proceeded with his men to the next target, Major General Agui Ironsi, the General Officer Commanding. However, they were unable to arrest him because Ironsi was attending a party at another location unknown to them. 
He returned in the early hours of the morning only to receive a timely phone call from the Prime Minister's residence informing him of the situation. At this point, all but one of the Lagos targets had either been killed or arrested by the Majors. The experienced Ironsi managed to evade his captors and make his way to two brigade Apapa headquarters. There, he rallied around officers and started planning a counter-attack operation against the mutineers. The 5th Battalion Kano was commanded by the dynamic Oxford-trained Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku. He was at the parade ground when he received a telegram informing him about the coup. Ojuku disarmed his soldiers and locked the armory, sending the key to a relative for safekeeping. He also took the Emir of Kano, Alahaji Adobayeru, to the battalion for his protection. The officer whose responsibility it was to conduct the operation in Kano, Captain Udi, was promptly arrested and detained by Ojuku. The Kano leg of the coup was a failure. Major Ifejuna sent orders to the 1st Battalion Enugu, asking them to deploy soldiers to take over key installations and arrest government ministers in Enugu and Benin. Premier Dennis Osadebe was placed under house arrest, while Dr. Michael Obara was also arrested. Lieutenant Colonel David Ejo was commander of the 1st Battalion Enugu. He was away in Lagos when the coup occurred. When he reported to the GOC, Ironsi, he was ordered to fly back to Enugu and crush the rebellion, but not before he was squarely scrutinized to know what side he was playing for. Ejo flew back to Enugu and took charge of the situation. Back at 2nd Battalion Ikeja, Ironsi had mobilized a team of loyal officers and troops to counter the mutineers. Among those officers was one Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowon. Ironsi ordered the arrest of Ademoyega, Okafo, Chukuka, and Ifejuna. By the next morning, word had spread to other army units about the debauchery that had occurred overnight. More officers, including Major Mutala Mohammed and Captain Theophilus Danjuma, joined in the counter-operation to suppress the revolt. Major Okafo's inability to arrest Ironsi marked a turning point in the coup of January 15, 1966. By midday, Ironsi had taken back control of Lagos and all the coup plotters were either arrested or on the run. The nation found itself in a state of confusion with the Prime Minister and other top government officials assassinated. The surviving members of the Council of Ministers called for a meeting to determine the way forward given the current situation of things. And by January 16, 1966, the acting president, Dr. Nwafo Urizu, announced to Nigerians that a unanimous decision had been reached to voluntarily hand over the administration of government to the military. The 42-year-old GOC, Major General Agui Ironsi, had been vested with authority as the head of the federal military government and supreme commander of the Nigerian Armed Forces. My main concern is to restore law and order as soon as possible. This will set the stage for another coup in the next six months.